Uh, Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24. Now, I don't know about you, but even this morning, now you would think on Easter morning, uh, everybody would have happy faces and sweet spirits. You would think on Easter morning that our kids would be, they would wake up and because the Easter money may have come by and seen them and they've gotten presents and they got 17,000 eggs yesterday and eggs earlier, you would think our kids would wake up and they would just be joyful and Hi, mother. Hi, father. You're the greatest parents ever. And you would think our spouses would wake up this morning and go, Oh, it's Easter. You are my resurrection. (laughs) You would think that, right? But I'll just be honest. I've walked around. I've tried to stay away from some of you because you have that face today. But I've noticed, even trying to stay away from many of us, that that some of us right now could probably use some good news. And that leads us to an opening fact. The opening fact is this. God knows we, all, we can all use some good news. God knows we can all use some good news. Can you use some good news? Well, let me read some to you. Jesus says in John 16, he says, In the world you'll have trouble, but cheer up. Underline that phrase, cheer up. But cheer up. I have overcome the world. You know what he's saying? He's saying, hey, listen, I know you had a bad morning. I know you've had a rough week. I know maybe when you went to take that perfect Easter photo, your camera didn't work, or, or maybe the kid then decided to pick their nose or to bend over. I know that you've had a rough week and things have not gone the way you you've planned them for, and we all had some good plans for today, did we not? But Jesus is saying, hey, guess what? Cheer up. I've overcome it. You see, that's one of the things I love about my God. My God does not act like everything's perfect. My God does not act like I have the perfect marriage or the perfect children. My God does not act like my church is perfect or this community is perfect, this this state, nation, world's perfect. He doesn't act like it, but what he says is this. He says, you know what? I'm not going to lie to you. You're going to have trouble. But cheer up. I've overcome it. I've already taken care of it. Now you just need to trust in me. That's one of the things I love about God. He's, he's brutally honest, yet powerfully optimistic. You might want to write that down. Our God is brutally honest, but powerfully optimistic. And he just loves sharing good news to people like us. He just loves sharing good news to people who will listen. Think about Christmas. Think about how many times at Christmas, he said, hey, here's some good news. Let me tell you some good news. He, he did it through the angels. He did it all throughout the story. He loves sharing good news, but can I share with you a truth? The truth is this. Easter offers the best news of all. Easter offers the best news of all. Romans 5, 6 says this. At just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly at Easter. You know what he's saying there? He's saying, you know what? There's good news. For example, when I saw on the bulletin that FFC Siler City is going to kick off their first service with ice cream, (laughs) that's good news. Is that not good news? It's like like the, the, the campus pastor just knows the head pastor pretty well. He knows how to get me out. I might not go to any other service, but I'm going to go to that first one because ice cream is going to be there, and I love me some ice cream. But he's saying, you know what, there's good news Then there's good news. Let me read you some good news. Read with me, if you would, in Luke chapter 24, beginning with verse 46. He said, And Jesus said, Yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. What's the message? Here it is. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. Now, did you get the good news? Did you see the good news that he shared? He shared with you the good news of Easter. It's found there in verse 47. Look at your sheet. Look on the screen. The good news of Easter is this. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. Underline that word sins. You say, Randy, why are you having me underline the word sin? That's the only negative part of the whole verse. Well, here's the thing. I am firmly convinced that most of us don't have a clear understanding of what sin is. And before we celebrate the fact that there's forgiveness of sins, we got to make sure we understand what sin is. Because I am being told more and more and more by people like Daniel Collins that they know people that have never admitted that they're sinful. So let me give you the definition of sin. The definition of sin is this. Disobeying God by the things we do and don't do. 
Sin is disobeying God by the things we do and don't do. You're saying, Randy, how do you get that? 1 John 3, 4 says, everyone who sins is breaking God's law. What's he talking about? He's talking about those things that Daniel does that he shouldn't do, those things that God says, hey, don't do it, Daniel, and Daniel does it anyway. Now, most of us understand that kind of sin. Don't lie. Don't cheat, right? We understand that kind of sin, but notice what James 4, 17 says. James 4, 17 says, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. He's saying, you know what? It's sin for you to know that you're supposed to be in church and then don't go. He says, it's sin for you to know that you're supposed to love your wife and then don't do it. He's saying, it's sin for you to know what you're supposed to do and then don't do it. And so can I ask you a question? Does that cover all of us? Have all of us at least done one thing that we shouldn't have done that we did? Have all of us not done the one thing that we should have done but we didn't? Does this cover all of us? So what does that mean for you and me today? That means that Easter gives good news to each of us because each of us sin. But here's the thing. God convicted me when I wrote that, and so I'm not surprised that it's happening now, that we seem to kind of have a ho-hum attitude toward that. That when somebody stands up and talks about forgiveness, we're like, oh, big deal. We have this ho-hum attitude. And why is that? Why, whenever I wrote that, did I not just stand up, lift my hands up to the Lord and say, thank you? Why did I not just stop and drop to my knees and say, thank you? When God told me that he had given me forgiveness of sin at Easter, why did I not shout hallelujah, praise the Lord? Why? Because I'm firmly convinced that we don't understand biblical forgiveness. So let me give you a brief overview. Look at your sheet. What is biblical forgiveness? First of all, biblical forgiveness is costly. Biblical forgiveness is costly. Ephesians 1, 7 says this, Father God purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sin. Now, can I share something with you that many of you might struggle believing? When I first got into ministry back in 1989, I'll be honest with you. I got into ministry because I love God. It was not because I love people. In fact, I had a mentor come to me. He kind of rebuked me when I was like uh, about 1990, 1991. He said, Randy, he said, I know you love God, but the people that you're serving, the people that you're leading, they don't know that you love them. And I had to be honest. I had to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I need you to give me a love for people because you know what? People are dumb. People get on my nerves. People frustrate me. God, when I started ministry, I had a full head of hair. Now look at me. And so I said, God, will you give me a love for people? And you know what he asks? That's one of those prayers that he answers every time when we sincerely pray it. And so can I tell you something that's happened to me in the last 10 years? I die for most of you. I die for you. I'm firmly convinced if somebody walked into this, this service right now with a gun and, and I had the opportunity to step in front of the bullet for you, I would. Why? Not because of anything I've done, but because God's given me a love for you. I love you. That's why I preach so hard. That's why we work so hard around here. Why? Because God has given me a compulsive, overwhelming love for you. But can I tell you something? I have one son. And to ask my son to die for you, I don't think I can. I don't know if I could ask my son to die for anybody. You see, the hardest things I've done in life so far has been to let him go. When I let him go to the Navy, my heart broke in a thousand pieces. This June, when I have to send him to Japan for three years, It already makes me sick to my stomach. But to let him die for you? Not even good people because we've just established that we're all sinners. But to die for sinners like you and me? Just don't know. But notice what Romans 5, 7, and 8 says. It says, finding someone who would die for a godly person is rare, yet Christ died for us while we were still sinners. This demonstrates Father God's love for us. Are you beginning to see the amazing price that our Father in heaven paid for your forgiveness? Are you beginning to see the amazing cost of God forgiving you? He had to give up his son for you. It was so costly to him. And so biblical forgiveness, that's good news. But notice, biblical forgiveness is costly. But notice, secondly, it is also complete. 
Biblical forgiveness is complete. Notice what Colossians 2, 13 and 14 says. It says, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sin. Underline that word, all. He canceled the record of the charges against us, and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. Let me ask him, have you ever felt like there was some, always somebody looking over your shoulder, keeping a list of your mess-ups? Have you ever felt that there was somebody, this some heavenly thing, this universal being that was taking notes and, and taking note of all the mess-ups, all the sins, all the lies, all the things that you did do that you shouldn't have done, the things that you shouldn't have done that you did do? Have you ever, have you ever felt that way? Well, can I tell you something? That's true. The Bible says that God is. That God has a record of all of our sins. God has a record. He has a list of all of our wrongdoings. But you know what? The good news of Easter is this. The good news of Easter is that God took our whole sin list, all the sins that we have committed, all the sins that we are committing, all the sins that we will commit, and he covered it on the cross. He covered it with the blood of Jesus. You're saying, Randy, I don't know if I believe that. You don't believe me? We'll look at 2 Corinthians 5, 19. It says God was, was in Christ making peace between the whole world. Underline that word world. Between the whole world and himself, not putting their sins to their account. You know what he's saying there? He's saying that whole world there, that means cosmos. That means the universe. And so if you're part of all in Colossians 2, 13, or if you're a part of this universe, then what God is saying is that, you know what? That list that I have of all your sins, of what you did five years ago, five minutes ago, 20 years ago, it's been covered. It's been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. You've been forgiven. That's good news. Are you beginning to see why it shouldn't be ho-hum? That every time somebody talks about biblical forgiveness, your heart should skip a beat. Every time somebody talks about biblical forgiveness, there should be a rumbling in your tumbling. Why? Because an amazing thing has happened to you and to me. But notice, not only is biblical forgiveness costly, it is complete, but it is also crazy. Biblical forgiveness is crazy. Notice what Luke 17, 3 and 4 says this. It says, if your brother or sister sins, warn them to stop. If they change their hearts and lives, forgive them. Even if someone sins against you seven times in one day and returns to you seven times and says, I am changing my way, you must, underline that word must, you must forgive that person. Did you, did you see that? That is a tough command. God is saying, hey, I don't care how many times they mess up. I don't care how many times they do you wrong. If they ask for forgiveness, you must forgive them. You're saying, Randy, why in the world would I do that? Why? Because that's how crazy God's forgiveness is of us. You do remember. Remember what 1 John 1, 7 says. It says, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. There it is again. He's saying again that every sin has been forgiven. And so that's why Colossians 3, 13 says, forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. What's he saying there? He's saying, you know what? It's not our job just to forgive acceptable sins. You know, what I, you know what your acceptable sins is? Yeah, you can turn your notes over. You can write on this. You know what your acceptable sins are? Your acceptable sins are the sins you do. And so what I have found, it is just real easy for Jason to forgive his wife and his children for all the things that he does. Why? Because he understands that because he does it. But know what God is saying. You know what? Our job is to forgive. Though you've crossed the line. You've gone too far. You've sinned too much. Sins. Why? Again, why? Why would we do that? Why? Because God the Father has forgiven us. Many of you came to the Siler City Easter egg hunt, right? Great time, 11, 1,200 people. Siler City hadn't seen something like that in a long time. But did you know that at that Siler City Easter egg hunt, there was a man, about six foot two, about 285 pounds, that in a church meeting like this came down the aisle wanting to kick my tail. He was cussing me in church, he was calling me names, and he literally had to be restrained because he wanted to punch me in the face in the middle of church. You're saying, Randy, what'd you do to him when you saw him at the Siler City Easter egg hunt? I hugged his wife and I petted his kids. You're saying, how could you do that? How? What do you mean, how? Do you realize some of the stupid stuff that God's forgiven me for? Do you remember all the crazy things that you've done? 
You see, when I start thinking about all the forgiveness that God's given me, I can't help but give that to others. Why? Because God says, you know what? What has been given must be given away. And so our forgiveness is crazy because we crazily forgive others because God has crazily forgiven us. Write this passage down if you don't mind. I'd like for you to read it sometime this week. Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Matthew 18, 21 through 35. It's not going to be on your screen. This is something I'm throwing on Ben right now. Matthew 18, 21 through 35. It tells the story of a king that had forgiven somebody $7 billion of debt. A king had forgiven somebody $7 billion of debt. Say, hey, I forgive you. Your debt is gone. You don't owe me anything. I've let your debt go. And the story goes on to say that that guy who had been forgiven $7 billion walks out of the king's room and goes out to somebody that owed him $700,000. Now, $700,000, that's a lot of money, ain't it? If somebody owed me $700,000, they'd have my attention, wouldn't they? All right? And, and, and guess what? The person that owed him $700,000 begged him, asked him, pleaded, oh, please forgive me. Please forgive me for the debt that I owe. And you know what? The guy refused. The guy refused to forgive him. And Jesus talked about how horrible it is for somebody who had been forgiven so much to refuse to forgive somebody else. And you see, our job as Christians, it's saying over and over again, you know what? You have to forgive others the way God has forgiven us. And it's going to cost, it's going to be complete, and it's going to be crazy. So are you beginning to see why this forgiveness is good news? That God, even if I sin seven times in one day, he's going to forgive me if I ask him. God, no matter what I do, he's going to forgive me. God's forgiveness is amazing. But look at your sheet. Did you notice the key to receiving forgiveness? Did you notice the key to receiving this incredible, awesome, amazing forgiveness? This forgiveness that's worth shouting about. Did you notice the key? Go back to Luke 24, 47. He says, there is forgiveness of sin for all who repent. Underline that word, repent. He's saying, you want to get forgiveness? You want this amazing forgiveness? You want the forgiveness of Easter? Then you must repent. And that leads us to this important truth. The truth is this. The truth is the good news of Easter is available to all, but not enjoyed by all. The good news of Easter is available to all, but not enjoyed by all. Look what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 14. He says, the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. What's he saying? God's revealing that, you know what? While everyone has been offered forgiveness, not everybody has received it. Why? Because Luke 24, 47 says, we only receive forgiveness after we repent. Now, here's the thing, though. I have found that repentance is even less understood than sin, that we don't understand what repentance is. So let me tell you real quickly, what is repentance? What is biblical repentance? How do we know if we've received God's forgiveness? Because wouldn't it be a sad to think that you have received God's forgiveness and you never have? And so what is biblical forgiveness? Look at your sheet. Biblical repentance starts in the mind. Biblical forgiveness starts in the mind. In fact, let me give you the literal definition of repentance. It means to change the way we think about our sin. To change the way we think about our sin. 2 Peter 3 9 says, God doesn't want to destroy anyone, but wants all people to have an opportunity to turn to him and change the way they think. That's what it means to repent. He's saying that repentance starts in the mind. In fact, I was talking this week with a lady. Her father was an alcoholic, but he's been sober for two years. And I said, How did that go? She said, Well, he just realizes that, you know what, all those excuses that he used to have for drinking. They're not okay. All those reasons he had for drinking, like he was going through a stressful situation, he called up one of his family members and said, you need to come over and get this or I'm going to start drinking. What did he understood? He had repented and what had used to be okay about drinking was no longer okay. It wasn't okay to get drunk like it used to be. Now some of you are saying, well, Randy, how do I know? How if I know if I've really changed the way I think about my sin? Well, look at this fact. The fact is this. True repentance, true repentance leads us to hate our sin. True repentance leads us to hate our sin. Psalm 97.10 says this, you who love the Lord hate, underline that word hate, evil. What's he saying? He's saying, hey, if you've truly repented of your sin, then what you'll feel is it'll disgust you. It'll upset you. When you think about it, you're not drawn to it. You, You get mad at it. 
And so if you want to know if you truly repented or not, let me ask you, have you, have you allowed God to give you a hatred for your sin? Let me give you kind of a, a light example of this. I have repented of broccoli. I have repented of broccoli. You're saying, Randy, why is that good news to me? Well, here's why. You know, I hear all the time, well, Randy, I, I'm good with my sin until I have a bad day, and then, then on my bad day, I, I give in, and I go eat that whole 18 pounds of ice cream, that big old hunk of Hershey bar, the two-pound one they have in the gas station now. Randy, I, I do good, and then those days happen. Well, can I tell you something? Even on my worst days, I don't volunteer for broccoli. Even on my worst days, I don't go home to Jennifer and say, Jen, will you fix me some broccoli? Because I could really use some broccoli. I, I've just had a rough day. Why? Because I've repented. I have allowed myself, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, to develop a holy hatred for broccoli. And so if you want to repent today, you've got to say, Oh, God, I want your forgiveness, and I can't get your forgiveness unless I repent. And so, Oh, God, please give me a holy hatred for my sin. And so let me ask you this question. The question is this. Have you changed the way you think about your sin? Have you allowed God to give you a hatred for it? Why? Because true biblical repentance starts in the mind. But notice, secondly, biblical repentance turns to God. Biblical repentance turns to God. Acts 3.19 says this. Now repent of your sin and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. You know what I, you know what I found? is that a lot of people will repent of their sin, but then they stop. They stop right there. They don't turn to God. A lot of people, they, they stop doing their sin, but they're, they're still far from God. And, and here's why that breaks my heart. That's so sad. Why? Because you're not getting the joy, the pleasure of sin anymore, but you're not getting forgiveness either. Right? You're just stuck somewhere in this holy mess. You're not sinning and enjoying it, and you're not with God and enjoying his forgiveness. You're just stuck right here in the middle. That's my problem with a lot of drug addicts. I know a lot of drug addicts, they've repented of sin, but they haven't turned to God. And so here they are. They're trying their best to live for God. They're trying their best to do good and not mess up. And they're not sinning, but they're not with God either. And guess what? Those good people are going to go to hell. Because unless you repent and turn to God, there is no forgiveness of sin. Unless you turn to God, your sins may not be wiped away. And so my question for you is this. I'm proud of you if you've stopped sinning. But have you turned to God? Have you turned to God? Have you, has your repentance led you to Jesus? Why? Because if you want the repentance that leads to forgiveness, it must start in the mind. But it, secondly, it must turn to God. But there's a third thing. True repentance, biblical repentance, takes faith. Biblical repentance takes faith. Mark 1.15 says this, Repent of your sins and believe. I don't like that word believe. That literally means faith. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. What's he saying there? He's saying, you know what? For us to fully repent, we have to faith the good news about forgiveness. Why? Because forgiveness gives us hope. You want to know why some of you have never received God's forgiveness? Because you think you've gone too far. You think you've done too much. You think you've messed up. But when you faith the forgiveness of God, when you faith the good news of Easter, we have hope that we haven't gone too far. We haven't sinned too much. We aren't a lost cause. You see, the good news of Easter is that everyone has hope who trusts in Jesus. And so my question for you is this. Do you faith the good news? Do you faith the good news? Do you trust that God can forgive even you? You see, here's where my heartbreak is. That alcoholic I was telling you about, he stopped drinking. He still refuses to turn to God. Why? Because he doesn't believe that God can fix even him. And God's telling me today that there's someone here today that maybe you, the reason you came to church is because you've repented. But you haven't turned to God. Why? Because you don't believe that he can save even you. Can I share something with you? Let me sit down and share my testimony with you. I will let you know that you can't out the preacher. And if God can save me, he can save you. Oh, will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Every head bowed. Every eye closed.
saying, Randy, I just don't get it. Why have y'all done all of this? Why have you spent thousands of dollars? Why have you stuffed 16,000 eggs? Why have you shook hands with 3,000 people out in the hot sun? And Randy, didn't you have better things to do this Easter? Oh, yeah. We did all of this so that we might have a chance. We did all of this because we've been shared the good news We've talked, we've, we've learned that, that God forgives sinners like us and that he wants to save people like you. And we've done all of this over this past week, over the past weeks and months leading up to this. Why? So that we could give you this chance, that we could give you this moment to receive the good news of Easter. And can I share something with you? You're not here by accident. You may think you're here because a friend invited you. You may think you're here because we had photos or we did breakfast. No, you're here because God wanted you here. He brought you here for such a time as this. Now is your time for forgiveness. Now is your day of salvation. But my question for you is this, are you ready to repent? Are you ready to to let God change the way you think about your sin? Are you ready to turn to God and put your faith in Him? Are you ready? You do realize repentance is a gift. If, If you're feeling hatred toward your sin, if you're feeling your mind change about your sin, if you're feeling a desire to turn to God and and you're feeling faith right now, those are gifts from God. You can't do that. God's doing it for you, and that's his invitation. If you're feeling led, if you're feeling longing, if you're feeling a desire to do it, that's God. He's inviting you. He's drawing you. He's speaking to you. He's saying, come on, I want to save you. It's the best Easter present of all. And so are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready to turn to God? Are you ready to put your faith in Him? You're saying, well, Randy, what do I do? How do I do it? Well, the Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be forgiven and saved. Whoever calls. You're saying, what does it mean to call? It means to talk to God. It means to cry out to God. The picture is you drowning in the ocean and and crying out for a life preserver. That's what it means to call on the name of the Lord. And if you're ready to do that now, right now, we can. You're saying, well, Randy, I don't know what to say. I don't even know what to cry out. I don't know what to say. Well, in just a few seconds, I'm going to do for you what somebody did for me some years ago. I was like you. I was, I was, wanting, I was repentant, and I wanted to be forgiven. I wanted Jesus to save me, and I didn't know what to say. And so he prayed this prayer with me, just like I'm getting ready to pray with you. And I repeated the words after him, and I got saved. I received God's forgiveness. And in just a few seconds, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And if you'll pray this prayer with me to God, don't pray it to me. I can't save anybody. But if you'll pray this prayer with me to God, then you can be forgiven. You can be saved. You can be given a new heart and a new life. You're saying, Randy, do I have to pray it out loud? I'd like for you to. In fact, this is what I'm going to do to encourage you. There are going to be people all around you. They're going to be praying this prayer with me out loud. Why? Not because they need it, because they want to help you make the most important decision of your life. And so if you call yourself a Christian today, I'm encouraging you, I'm inviting you to repeat these words after me. Maybe not for yourself, or maybe you just want to renew your vows, but pray it for those around you who may be making the most important decision of their life. So would you pray with me? Would you just pray? Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Be my Savior and Lord. And Jesus, help me to live for you. It's in your name I pray. Oh, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you prayed that prayer with me, then guess what? You've been forgiven. You've received God's gift of salvation. You're saying, Randy, what do I need to do now? The Bible says the first thing you need to do is tell somebody. You can tell somebody that you came with. You can tell somebody in your family. You can tell somebody on Facebook or Instagram, whatever. But you need to tell somebody the good news. You can tell me or Jason or somebody as you're walking out the door. But tell somebody what happened to you today. Oh, let me pray for you. Dear God, I thank you. I thank you for the good news of of Easter. I thank you that you forgive us when we repent. 
And Lord, I just pray that you will be with those who prayed that prayer with me, that, that prayer of repentance, that prayer of salvation. Lord, help them to know that they know that they know that once you get a hold of them, you're never going to let go. And Lord, I just pray that you'll be with the rest of this invitation. Move mightily and powerfully, Lord. It's in your name I pray. Amen.